Nebraska gets a road win in the Big Ten. So is everything okay now? We break it down next. You are locked on Nebraska, your daily Nebraska Cornhuskers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Nebraska your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome. It is a reaction show. Connor Happer from 1620 The Zone in Omaha. Mitch Sherman from The Athletic, live from uh, downtown Chicago. Uh, Mitch, there's a mini bar right behind you. Uh, you, you've earned it. It's been, a, it's been a long day. Turn around, show people the mini bar. Let's, let's see what you got cooking. Oh yeah. There it couple, is. Couple nine fifty dollar, uh, nine or nine dollar and 50 cent bottles of water. If you want to pop those suckers open, that'd be nice. That's just water. That's not a bar. There is a bar across the street though. And when we get done with this, uh, that may be where I'm headed. <laughs> uh, Nebraska wins today, 28 to 10 against Purdue in, uh, in cloudy as always, but sometimes sunny. Uh, West Lafayette uh, popped out at times. It was zero zero through the first half. There was widespread panic ensuing across the masses. Um, and then Purdue got a field goal on their first drive and Nebraska came right mm-hmm. back and scored, got three quick touchdowns in the fourth. And that's your story, right? I mean, that's, that's your story. First half, second half. Sure. Yeah. Just a tw- nice little 28 point second half, a pick six from John Bullock, perfect offensive showing in the second half after Nebraska couldn't do anything, even snap the ball for a field goal in the first half when Purdue <laughs> went up three to nothing with six minutes left in the third quarter. The thought of Nebraska losing three to nothing definitely crossed my mind. (laughs) Oh, it was on the table. It it was on the table. Um, Like you felt like Nebraska was, they were, they were moving the ball. um, Offensively. In fact, they, they drove into, I mean, So first drive, they get it down to the Purdue 39 before they miss. Oh, I can tell you this. I can tell you this. I have it right in front of me. Yeah. Give me the, give me the, uh, they were at the 34. They were at the 34 on the first drive. And then they took a five yard penalty to try to pin Purdue with the punt punt, which the gunner for Nebraska ran straight past into the end zone as the ball settled down and rolled, rolled for a touchback second drive missed field goal from from 42 yards after the fourth and one false start at the 18 yep third drive there was a third and three toss to Dante Dowdell that got nothing that one ended with a punt to the 10 so Nebraska was also inside the 30 on that one then we had a blocked field goal Um, from by John Hole from 44 yards after Riola Dylan Riola was sacked at the 23 yard line and there was a punt to the six that followed a false start on third and one at the Purdue 38 and then finally another field goal blocked from 32 yards after two Riola incompletions on third down from the 16 so six drives all of them reached the 38 or closer two blocked field goals two punts (laughs) just a mess it was a mess offensively Okay, so which drive, Mitch, had the Fedoni Phantom pass interference? Oh, yes. Th- was yeah, that, that was the, the third drive? That was the third drive. Uh, yeah. Ramir Johnson on fourth and three catches the 22 yard touchdown pass, and Fedoni is flagged for offensive pass interference. <laughs> As Thomas Fedoni said, the last interview of the of the day before Nebraska Nebraska's media relations staff said, "Okay, out of here, pack up the bus." Was <laughs> Thomas Fedoni saying that was a ridiculous call? I didn't touch the guy. Uh, so, so, so I think now, hear me out, because I, I I think I'm on. I, I think I have what happened. Um, not this. I can't explain how bad the call was. I mean, it was it it was horrendous. But if you remember, rule challenged it. And the only thing that you could challenge on that, you can't challenge whether a penalty happens or not. You could challenge whether the receiver was behind the line of scrimmage when he caught the football. Absolutely. Did this not get explained on the Peacock broadcast? It did, but they, okay. so they did that a week ago and you know, it didn't, it didn't work out. Same thing. Um, and then they did it this week, but it was clearly beyond the line of scrimmage when, when, when he caught the football. So my, my guess is that rule challenged it only to make the officials have to watch 
how badly they missed the call. That's my theory. That's my been my operating theory all day. I'd like to ask them in private, you know, hey, you just want to show the officials that, you know, here's what you got wrong because he's not going to get it back, right? He's <laughs> He loses the challenge for the first time. They definitely had to watch it. That's for <laughs> sure. They had to watch it and they had to think, oh, no, but we can't do anything about that. And there is some value to that because then – as human nature works, the officials might attempt to give a makeup call in Nebraska's favor after they had seen that mess. And the Huskers did benefit from six pass interference calls on Purdue. <laughs> that just sounds ridiculous to say. Purdue I like to call it uh, weaponized pass uh, weaponized pass interference. That's that's what yeah. they're doing. They're throwing the football. You see it in the NFL all the time. Oh, for they're sure. Throwing the football down the field. And Dylan Rayola, I it's, think, it purposely a couple times is under-throwing his receivers so that they have to turn around and come back for it. It's way it's way better to do in the NFL because you get it at the spot of the foul. And in college, mm -hmm. it just gets you 15 yards. But that's 90 yards of additional passing offense that Nebraska gained. It seemed like Purdue's strategy in pass defense at one point was just to tackle Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nair whenever the ball was thrown in their direction. Yeah, it 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 definitely seemed that way. By the way, in our in our uh, picks show on Friday, we had to guess if Nebraska would commit a personal foul or not. Matt Rule, uh, they did, and neither of us picked Matt Rule chucking his headset down um, afterwards. So that brings us to our our video today that we have from Matt Rule in the uh, in the press conference where he was asked about kind of the sequence there, um, this and then. He he had the quote of the afternoon. Go ahead, Mitch. The, oh, this this was his. He was arguing a holding call on Banks. So there was a play that was that was brought back because Banks was. Uh, it was to one of the running backs. I think it was a it was a check down pass to one of the running backs, if I remember right. Maybe Emmett Johnson and Jamal Banks was flagged for holding. It looked like he just ran into the defender, and they all fell over in a pile. And then Rule, well, let, let's let him see what say what he did. Um, I, I, I got a flag. I threw my headset. Now I was on the white, so I was under the impression on, on the white I could throw my headset. Um, he said I, the referee said I looked at him, so he knew I was, you know, I was upset. But obviously, he didn't throw the flag, so I was, I was just mad, you know. Um, so I'm not here to complain about officials. Um, I'll turn them in. I'll get the responses on Monday or on Sunday. Um, you know, I think we had a, a tough go of it last week, and uh, you know what? I, here's what I know. Someone's going to have to start to fight for Nebraska, all right? So uh, I'm here to fight for Nebraska. And so um, Troy, you know, Troy does, uh, our AD will fight for Nebraska in that way. But, you know, I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted the fellows to see me out there fighting for him today. What's he talking about? Fighting for Nebraska. Okay, he referenced narratives a few times today. Mm -hmm. I think he's a little miffed at the narrative that Nebraska can't win close games, that Nebraska is trending toward being soft in the wake of the way that he described and others described the second half against Illinois. They're just, I think, feeling some of the, some of the eyes and the critics who have lashed out. It was, it's been a rough week. It was a rough week. We went over this. We talked about it. The post Illinois hangover among the fan base and the pundits around Nebraska football. It wasn't, it wasn't all that kind. This wasn't like year one getting over a loss. It was a different a different vibe around Husker Nation, I would say, over the past eight days. And it was a longer week than usual, and they had to sit around and sulk in it for a full weekend instead of just one day last week. And I think it wore on him and players in, in the program. And that's 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 good. If that's if that's a little bit of motivation, they were I, I got the, the feeling they were tired of it. And he says I'm going to stand up and fight for Nebraska because I don't get the sense that a whole lot of people out there in the public are doing it. Yeah. Um, he, he was also, he answered that question in context. He was mad at the refs talking about officiating too. <laughs> um, and it has been two straight weeks where it's been, um, I mean, almost borderline. I would say like both of those games officials, like lost control. I mean, there was just a lot of, a lot of different things going on. Penalties. All, the, I, I swear the ref three out of four because Colorado, the, the second half, talking, they lost control. The ref was talking for the entire, it, first of all, I, I, Mitch, you didn't watch a game on, on Peacock. You watch it from the stadium. Um, but the Peacock broadcast, uh, you couldn't hear really what the announcers were saying at all because their sound mixing was awful. 
And I think they shoved a field mic inside of a trumpet in the band section or right next to the big train <laughs> horn that they blow off every 10 <laughs> seconds at Purdue. Um, so it was it was a mess from there. But I heard the ref loud and clear and I heard him a lot. He was he, he had a lot of things to say, in, especially in the first half. Can you really now they took a touchdown away from Nebraska that that was just a terrible call. And I think all of the DPIs were legit. Like th there were none that I thought were questionable. But Purdue must have been flagged more than Nebraska in this game. They were. I yeah, I the officiating is just bad. It's not necessarily bad in a way that consistently hurts Nebraska. Sometimes it hurts Nebraska. Sometimes they're just throwing flags to throw flags. There's plays well, where I, there's multiple flags. In this game, it seemed like, yeah, probably was most of the flags against Purdue were legit, and some of the ones against Nebraska were not. But it's just a, it's a it's a it's a it's a continuing uh, epidemic of bad officiating. The Big Twelve officials in the Nebraska Colorado game it got out of hand in the second half last week as Nebraska played Illinois. It wasn't great this week. It wasn't great. I think Rule is also fed up with that. I think, um, you know, I, I think he's talking about not necessarily it being against Nebraska. I think he's talking about just like it, mm -hmm. it in general, right? Nebraska's playing in these games where maybe it's a little bit lower down the totem pole as far as what the Big Ten wants to, um, you know, showcase in terms of their officiating crews, which crews are assigned to what game. And so it's a couple of weeks in a row where Nebraska maybe didn't get the, um, they kind of got the short end of the stick as far as the 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 game you know, in the context of the conference. And so, uh, I don't know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be different going forward, but this has been a, a talking point for a long, long time now. Um, and you know, it, it remains so after this one. Yeah. Okay. Let's come back after the break. And I will tell you why I thought this was of all five of Dylan Raiola starts the most impressive one that he's put on tape. That's next. Uh, but first, it's, here, it's Happer here for the FanDuel Sportsbook. Getting ready for the NFL on a Sunday afternoon. Well, you could start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get the hunch in the middle of a game, you could check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more right on that same page where you place your bets. It's all right there for you. That's what that's the beauty of the FanDuel Sportsbook. Live as it happens, or you could uh, plan it out a little bit as well. All the options are there for you in the FanDuel Sportsbook. And when you join up now, you get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's right. 200 bucks guaranteed in bonus bets when you place your first $5 bet. Head over to FanDuel.com and get started today. And Mitch Sherman here to tell you about game time. It is college football season. If you haven't noticed, the pennant races are just about over. Maybe they are over. And maybe you noticed that the Kansas City Royals are in the playoffs. So if you would like to get tickets to see the Kansas City Royals play on the road in the American League wildcard series, I would recommend that you use game time. This is a historic event. And I am considering... <laughs> Well, I don't know what I'm considering, but maybe taking three days off this week just to, to uh, uh, rally to around. Houston. Yeah, I could go to Houston. <laughs> anyway, Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. It makes getting tickets easier and faster. Prices on the app go down the closer you get to first pitch. So whatever you want to do this fall, if you want to go to concerts, baseball games, college football games. If it's a hot ticket, it's there on game time. I love that you can see flash deals, views from your seat. You can customize your spot in the stadium. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the app, create an account, use the code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Okay, welcome back. Second half of this reaction show. Nebraska beats Purdue 28 to 10 on Saturday in West Lafayette, Indiana. Mitch Sherman here from The Athletic. Connor Happer is joining me from back home in Nebraska. Connor from 1620 The Zone. So I will be flying back home tomorrow. Made the uh, made the, the harrowing travel um, 
ride back from uh, from West Lafayette into the into the big city. Almost ran out of gas this morning, Connor, on my way to West Lafayette. Forgot that the rental car that I picked up had just a quarter of a tank. Why does that happen? Why 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 give me a car a with a quarter of a tank? Yeah, it yeah, happens. that's not that's not right. Come on, they gave it to me with a quarter of a tank. They said, "Oh, you can take it back empty." I said, "All right, fine." And then I forgot that it had a quarter of a tank until the fuel light was on and I was in the middle of rural Indiana, but I was able to get to a gas station. Hey, one other thing about this game um, that I was thinking about on the drive back as I stopped and got a Cinnabon at, at the, the gas station in the, <laughs> I eat really healthy on the road. Clearly. I didn't eat in the press box. It's the first time I think I've ever covered a college football game and did not have a morsel of food, only water. It was the only thing I ate in the press box, not by design. I didn't think that anything looked good when I got there. They were serving popcorn at halftime. There was nothing after the game. So I walked out, nothing. Like this is a milestone achievement for me that I'm I'm probably now going to have to take back to Lincoln and try not to eat the, the normal eight pieces of pizza that I wow. stuffed down after a home game. You were in and out. You were in like nobody ever knew you were there. You never left in, any sort of imprint on West Lafayette, Indiana today. You were just like, let's go to the game. Don't touch anything and go back to Chicago. Wow. Pretty much. That's pretty much That's what impressive. happened. So Dylan Raiola left an input on West Lafayette, Indiana. Nice. So Nebraska's freshman, you know, ho-hum, another day at the office for young Dylan. He finishes, let's see here, 16 of 26 for 244 yards in one touchdown. Is that right? I had him at 257 earlier. 17 well, for 27, 257 right. and a touchdown. Okay. Yeah. All right. The stats that I'm looking at are incorrect. Thank you for, he had another 13 yard pass in there. I'm glad it was 257 because that's what I wrote in my post game write up. I think, Connor, this was Dylan's best performance yet. Just one touchdown pass. But the reason I say this is because everything around him was it was like the bombs going off in the background and the meme of like, there's nothing to see here. Yeah. That's what the first half was like. Now, he contributed a little bit to some of the mayhem and mishap. He took a sack. At one point, that put Nebraska behind the sticks through a couple of incompletions, but we're really getting nitpicky to put again any of this in the offensive uh, disorganization on Riola in the first half. He did what he needed to do, and it had to be amazingly frustrating to see officiating, special teams, penalties, lack of execution contributing to Nebraska just over and over and over failing to come up with points when it got into the red zone or the fringe of the red zone. And this comes on the heels of Nebraska doing that at the end of the game last week against Illinois. So the fact that Dylan was able to stay composed, never went ahead and rushed a throw that turned that led to a turnover, never just appeared to be out of sorts. It was his first time ever on the road. And then after halftime, boom. You know, things started to roll and he was at the helm again. I think all of that can together makes this even more impressive than what he did in the first four games. The poise is a great thing to point out. Um, I'll say this to to the offensive line's credit. He had a lot of time to throw today. I mean, he was mm -hmm. he was hanging out back in the pocket um, oh, yeah. quite a bit. And then yeah. and then made those throws. I mean, the throw to in the back of the end zone to Banks. Um, mm -hmm was was a, a, a pretty special one might not have looked like it but man it, it's it's between a couple defenders and it's a, a level deeper um and he's got to put it in the ex exactly the right space with the right pace um and he and he does like he does that routinely i mean he, it, we're at the point where he he has receivers he's so good in that kind of middle level that that 15 to 30 yard range uh, i mean it's it's very, he, he makes incredible throws just layered over linebackers with the right amount of touch, putting it out in front of his guys and stuff like that. Or if they're coming back to make a play, I mean, he he's, you know, we talked about it all last week. I think he's been the, the, the obvious bright shining spot for when all, and all this other stuff has kind of gone up and down. We haven't even talked about the defense yet who had a good day today. Um, he's just been steady Eddie. You know, right there in the middle, nine touchdowns now, two picks. Um, you know, we've talked about the two picks and how they're probably not his responsibilities. Um, man, you got that guy. You 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 got some places you're gonna go. 
Nebraska's committed just three turnovers in five games. The two picks from Dylan that were taken away from his receivers and then the one fumble in week one from Dante Dowdell at the goal line. That's it. And that's largely because of Dylan, because the fumbles that have occurred in previous years have been, for the most part, on the quarterbacks when Nebraska has incorporated the QB run game as, as such a big piece of his offense. So, you know, Dylan has been lucky a couple of times when when he's been loose with the ball, um, particularly late against Illinois and was able to get back on top of those. They bounced they bounced back to him, but he's taken great care of the ball, which is amazing to see for a true freshman right out of the gate. Uh, the the what you talk about with the the layered throws and getting the ball over the top of the linebackers. I wonder when that's going to change just a little bit because teams are 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 running are, are playing zone against Nebraska and you know I think with with Purdue despite having a good statistical pass defense Purdue thought that it it, it seemed to think that it could not cover Nebraska's top two receivers in in man coverage. And so when the ball did go to those guys, they didn't even try to play pass defense. They just took the 15 yards and tackled them. So yeah. In, in many other instances that Purdue was in zone to get help uh, over the top against the, the the big, tall Nebraska receivers. And Dylan is able to pick apart the zone with his ability to see it and diagnose it and to find Nebraska receivers like Thomas Fedoni started to show up in those spots today with three catches for 39 yards um, as, as zone busters. So at what point um, do teams switch even more and start to play more man coverage against, against Dylan, which, should in theory open some things up for the Nebraska run game. This is how this works offensively. You try yep. to, you, you you know, a defense adjusts, and then you if you have the ability to adjust adjust as an offense, that's when you take it to the next level. Uh, defensively today for Nebraska, a big a big bounce back day. So they allow 50 yards rushing on the ground, um, 174 through the air. They sacked Hudson Card five times. Um, and they got a pick six by John Bullock. Um, Fantastic. Which, I mean, it it was a it was a really, really nice bounce back day. Garbage touchdown at the end. There was some concern. Like, I mean, you know, Nebraska over the last couple of games, Northern Iowa and, and Illinois, they couldn't get off the field on third down. That was starting to, it, it turned into a trend a little bit later. There was only one, I think there was one third down conversion just like in the first half by both teams in general or something stupid like that. Purdue ended up at seven for 15 on third downs. Um, but I, I'd say Nebraska had a really nice bounce back day defensively. Yeah, I liked. I thought the pressure was good. I thought the havoc was good. I'll be interested to see what some of those numbers look like. Nebraska had a, a season low nine percent havoc rate last week, according to Pro Football Focus. So uh, when those numbers come out on Sunday, I expect that's that's going to be quite a bit higher. James Williams got his first sack of the year. MJ Sherman was active with a sack and a half. It was um, as you said, Bullock had the huge the huge play at the end. Uh, I feel good for him to to get that because he's probably been the the first half of the season so far, defensive MVP for Nebraska. You know who else was really good, and I think opens up some some intriguing thoughts for Nebraska as as it gets into the second half of the season after next week was Sire Wright, um, yeah. the USC transfer, who was filling in for Tommy Hill today. Tommy tried to go in this game, and he's got that plantar fasciitis flare up. It he wasn't able to go. Sire Wright came in. Almost had a pick, had a couple pass breakups, played really good in coverage against Purdue's best receiver, and and played through an injury too. He had a something that he went down with a, a lower body injury, and then later had a had a cramp near the sideline, and he kept coming back and 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 getting it done. So I think when Tommy Hill is back, you have to look potentially at at Wright and Hill being your corners, and maybe Marquise Buford can move back inside to safety, which is more of his natural position. One more thing, and we'll we'll do plenty of talking about this during the week, of course, as well. Um, Emmett Johnson. Um, yes. Uh, he, he we predict this? We, we said that Emmett jo it would be a big Emmett Johnson day. I, I didn't have the stones to say that he'd be the leading rusher. And for the record, he, nah, was, he not. was not. It, it was Ja'Cory <laughs> Barney, who we both said would have a big day. Um, yeah. But he, would, he ended season. up not. He didn't end up being Nebraska's leading receiver in this game. So it's a wash, I guess on that one. Um, he was really good in the second half. I think it gives you a lot to think about in that. I like anytime he's on the field, this is, this is his thing. Eight carries for 50 yards. He had a couple runs that popped. I thought he was patient. Um, and I, I just thought he did things that Dowdell hasn't been giving you over the, over the last couple games. So I, I, I think Emma Johnson's making a real run at a lot more snaps yeah. and earlier yeah. snaps. 
How about how about um, Carter Nelson at running back on the yeah. goal line? Tried to use that seven foot high jump ability to uh, to get him over the top. Didn't work. His first play ever as a running back at the at the eleven man football level is on the goal line on third and one in a Big Ten road game. Okay, you know Nebraska and Matt Rule talked about uh, playing to win and taking risks because this year is not about playing not to lose. There you go. That's it right there. Put Carter Nelson in, throw the kid into the fire. He didn't get in, but the next time he, he runs that play, he's going to be more comfortable, and it gives a Nebraska opponent something to look at when, when they're reviewing the film. And also, how about Heinrich Harburg going deep for a pass as a as a wideout in, yep. a, um, in the first half? That one, I believe, turned into a pass interference. So it did. As, it did. as all of the all of the deep throws to big, tall Nebraska receivers uh, seem to go. Uh, Nebraska is four and one they are one and one in the big 10. They will welcome in Rutgers next week who did win on Friday night, even though they were possibly outplayed well, Washington might be kicking themselves, um, on that one, but Rutgers is he ranked? Undefeated, probably going to be a ranked team coming to Memorial stadium. Um, so there's, there's quite the, there's, there's some intrigue there. Unless I'm mistaken, Rutgers received no votes in the poll last week in the AP wow. poll. Yeah, they just, they're just totally disrespected. I mean, don't they know this is Greg Schiano coaching these guys? This is this is uh, not Chris Ash Rutgers. This is Greg Schiano Rutgers. It's like a completely different program. They've done this before, and they're doing it again here right now. It's a dangerous team, uh, a dangerous team with a very good running back. I think Rutgers deserves to be ranked at this point with the way that it's playing, but I don't know if they can sneak all the way up there based off of that three-point win against Washington. We'll see. If it is, then all of the uh, all the streaks come back into play. Nebraska yep. 0 for its last 25 against nationally ranked teams. Hey, what did you think of the special teams? Oh, yeah, great thing uh, to talk about. They were the worst thing I've ever seen, possibly. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, two, two high snaps and um, block like I mean you know what led to each of those there's like there's three important things in this thing there's the snapper the holder the kicker and sometimes they all go bad and for Nebraska it seems like they all go bad in the same play and they end up in disaster I mean it's 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 a total mess you have to really consider right now like just throwing that away I mean I, I, I don't know what else you can probably do no field goals that. just no field goals <laughs> yeah, just, just go for it on fourth down yeah yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you get in the you get in the scoring range in the scoring zone, and it's four down territory. I mean, seriously, what would you rather have? Unless it's like fourth and fifteen from the twenty, what would you rather have? The ball in Dylan Raiola's hands with those receivers, the possibility of getting a pass interference, the possibility of him completing a throw, or this kicking situation. And Nebraska continues to 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 show confidence to say that they're confident in John Hole and and maybe Tristan Alvano will be back soon, but they have to do it in games before I think the team can feel confident. And it just hasn't been getting done in games. And it's not all on John Hole. Like he went 0 for 3 on field goals today, but two of the field goals were the ones that were blocked were virtually unmakeable for him because the holes were so bad as a result of bad snaps. It wasn't on Brian Buscini, who was Nebraska's special teams MVP, I think, for the tackles that he made. He made one to save a touchdown um late in the first half. And, yeah. and I'll say I'll finish on this with the special teams. It's in their heads because in the other areas mm -hmm. of special teams, which haven't been much of a problem until today, they're breaking down fundamentally, too. I mentioned the inability to down a punt after Nebraska's first possession at the one yard line when the ball was there. There was another play where. Bushini dropped it inside the 10 and the ball just kind of fell into Ramir Johnson's hands. He was one of the gunners and, and he didn't appear to, to even know that it was, it was going to bounce to him. It looks like just a lot of confusion out there. And then they're not really blocking for Isaiah Garcia Castaneda. Um, when he's catching, if he's not calling a fair catch, when he fields a punt, he's getting lit up. So all areas of special teams need immediate emergency attention in whatever way that possibly can be addressed. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, the problem is I don't know in which ways that you can. I mean, you only have the snappers that you have, the long snappers that you have, and and you only have the kickers that you have, at least at this point, until until Tristan Albano comes back. So, uh, yes, that will be a, uh, a talking point this week, Mitch. Uh, just quickly, elsewhere 
in the Big Ten before we get out of here. Uh, USC ended up beating Wisconsin with a couple late touchdowns today. Michigan had to survive against Minnesota on a very questionable onside kick. Um, late. Oh, I did not see that. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess we can go through it quickly. So, so Michigan's up like 24 to 3 in this game, mm-hmm. and then here comes Minnesota, and they get it all the way. An amazing catch by Darius Jackson in the back of the end zone gets it to a three-point game with, just a, with, with under a minute left. Yeah, incredible catch. And then Minnesota goes for an onside kick, and they recover it, but it is called an offsides, and I, I don't I don't think it was. <laughs> I, just, mm. I, just, I don't think it was offsides, so there was that happening today Good as job, well. Good job, Big Ten officials. Game. There's other games in progress, um, including Illinois and Penn State at the time that we record this. Uh, plenty plenty to get to this week. Uh, we'll talk to you again on Monday. Appreciate you listening to us in this reaction pod. Um, and we will talk to you soon.